is the last part of this uh, Superman series <clears throat> we've been a part of. But first I want to share a little bit of the story, the backstory from uh, this community and how we came to be. And this might be a refresher course for some of you, but so many of you are so new. I want you to know where the story came from and how it came into existence. <clears throat> so <clears throat> three years ago this month, three years ago, I sat in my office in Kansas City at a church that Gio and I had planted up there. And I stood looking out the window at the streets of Kansas City that were sheeted in ice, fresh sheet of ice on the streets of Kansas City. And then lining both sides of the streets were these huge mounds of snow, old snow, snow that had been there a while. It just never got warm enough for the snow to melt. And if you've ever seen like dirty old snow, it's just so ugly and it's a reminder of your depression in the middle of winter, you know. It's just awful, not pretty, ugly snow, right? So I stood looking out my window at that scene when my phone rang. And uh, I saw that it was a 713 number. And I knew the 713 area code because uh, I grew up in East Texas. I knew it was Houston. I picked it up and the voice on the other end said, uh, Eric, this is Tom Pace from St. Luke's Methodist. And I want to talk to you. I want to get you down here and talk to our team about what God's been up to around here and how you might be, you and Geo might be a part of it. And, uh, and I was shocked. Uh, St. Luke's, for a young boy growing up in East Texas as a Methodist, St. Luke's Methodist was like Mecca to Texas Methodism. Or I don't know how else to put it. Like, don't tell Dr. Pace that. Don't tell anybody else that. Like, it'll go to their heads, right? But like, St. Luke's was the biggest deal in my world when I was growing up in terms of Methodist churches. And so it was a shock to me. And I said, well, how, how quickly would you like us to get down there? And he said, we could book you a flight next week. I could tell they were ready to, to talk. And so by the end of our conversation, we were booked on a flight to come down to Houston at the end of February, uh, three years ago. Uh, when we got to Houston, it was 50 degrees. 50 degrees at the end of February. And I was sold, man. I was sold on Houston right away, like sold. Because I'd been cold for six months and I was sick of being cold. And I uh, I'd already made up my mind that Houston was for us. But what, what not everyone knew, what, I don't even think St. Luke's knew this at the time, we were already planning to come to Houston anyway. That year, like we were coming to Houston to plant a church in Cyprus. Um, beyond the uh, 99 Grand Parkway. Right? So 299, 290 and 249, right, go out, extend beyond the Grand Parkway, and we were going to go out there and plant, even though we had never really been there. We were like Google Mapsing, Google Earthing this thing, right, like this mission field where we were going to go and spend the rest of our lives <laughs> planting a church, just sight unseen, you're going to go in and just plant a church. And we were like looking at land to buy, and I was thinking this is going to be like Red Lick all over again, let's get a horse and a couple cows, and like Geo's freaking out because she's a city girl and has been her whole life. And one thing that this trip down to interview at St. Luke's afforded us was the ability to go and check out Cyprus with our own eyes. And uh, Cyprus is lovely. It's lovely, y'all. It's, uh, it's lovely, lovely, lovely. But we, uh, we just realized that we, we are not Cyprus people. <laughs> Maybe it's 290 that did it. Can I get a hallelujah? 290 convinced us we're just not <laughs> Cyprus people. And uh, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Just like, uh, it's like Jesus saved my eternal soul from Damnation, Dr. Pace saved my family from Cyprus and offered us a job. And here we are at uh, in the inner loop of Houston, the greatest kept secret in the South, I'm convinced. Inner loop Houston is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way of life. Expensive as all get out, but wonderful way of life. We moved here in July of 2014. Uh, quickly discovered Houston feels different in July than it does in February. <laughs> The brilliant recruiting strategy. If you have a company, you're recruiting, bring them here in February, man. You'll get them. Don't bring them in July. You know, but bring them in February. Uh, and, and right away when we got here, we started focusing on growing uh, our launch team. The launch team is just the church before you have worship services. So we had 20 people, 20, 25 people ready to go when we got here. We started cultivating that team. Some of you remember this. I'm looking out and seeing some familiar faces from way back, way back. Two and a half years ago. <laughs> um, 
we started growing that team from 20 to 200. We wanted to have 200 people on our launch team before we had our first official worship service. But first we knew we needed a name. So we wrestled with several names. We wrestled with the garden church. This was almost the garden church, which would be a little weird. I don't know, a little strange. The neighborhood was another name we thought about. This church came this close to being called Theophilus Church, and that's a true story. Those of you who are on the launch team, remember that was my favorite idea at the time. Theophilus is the name of the person to whom the gospel of St. Luke's St. Luke's gospel is addressed, right? So my dear, dearest Theophilus, uh, you know, uh, and then St. Luke writes his gospel. I thought, how cool, we're a part of St. Luke's and we could be called Theophilus at St. Luke's. This is amazing, it's perfect. And the whole launch team was like, that sounds awful. It sounds like a disease. I don't wanna invite my friends <laughs> to Theophilus Church. And so I didn't wanna have a name for this thing that uh, nobody would invite their uh, friends to. And so uh, then... then uh, my favorite idea for a church name, uh, some of you have heard this, my favorite idea for a church name was inspired by one of our biggest problems, perceived problems, when we were getting ready to launch. And that was the fact that we're launching a brand new church three blocks away from America's largest church. Everybody kept telling us that the traffic problems and the congestion would be a major issue and the parking would be a major issue. And so I thought about a church that is every weekend covered up with people holding signs like this. which is Lakewood Overflow Parking Church. <laughs> that could work. That could work. i get a perm and a teeth whitening, and they would never know the difference. And just come on in. <laughs> and I'm not a hater. I'm a lover. I'm a lover. I'm just saying we're trying to build a church that works here. So maybe that could work. Nobody liked the idea but me. So I just left it and uh, we just moved on with the mission set before us. We knew God was calling us to plant a different kind of a church, a kind of church where people that wouldn't normally feel comfortable at church walk in and go, this doesn't feel like a church. Because we knew there's a huge and growing segment of our population, our neighbors around us here in the inner loop and around the loop of Houston People that check none on that religious affiliation question at the, at the census time. And people that say I'm spiritual but not religious. People that say I'm agnostic or I'm just, I might be an atheist. You know, people with more questions than answers. People for whom the church has become the place where questions go to die. People that have been run out of churches for different reasons. We knew that God was calling us to plant a church for those people. And we knew also that stories transcend those religious bounds. Stories transcend people's own experience and brokenness from the past. That's why Jesus only told stories. He didn't preach doctrine at people. He told stories with people, real life stories about real life things. And that's why the Bible is best understood as one great big story, this novel of God's grace that's told over thousands of years of time. And Instead of just picking it apart and saying, well, this means they don't belong. This means they don't belong. Looking at it as a huge story where over time everyone belongs. When we look at it all as a story, when we learn to tell stories and we tell our stories and we say that stories matter, we realize there was something powerful there. And so God inspired us to name this place, the story, Houston. We grew from 20 to 200 in that first six months by holding events like uh, charity trivia night at the Phoenix Bar and a worship service at the Armadillo Palace Bar. And I'm picking up on a trend here. The, uh, <laughs> another worship service at the Bingo Hall where people gamble and drink and another service. No, we did a wine tasting event for Living Water International or French Country Wine. All that to say, I don't think we have a problem there. I hope, hopefully not. But all, all that to say, our first core practice that we claimed as a community, the first core practice that we wrote down in our materials was to go where people are. And not just to sit comfortably within these four walls and wait for people to come to us. To go where people are and let people know there's an alternative reality, an alternative kingdom that they can live in that's way better than the one they're living in. 
We're doing it again this Tuesday night for the barn dance. Shameless plug. Get your boots on and come dance for Jesus all night and let the world around you know that there's a better kingdom. We're going to go where the people are, and that didn't stop when we got this awesome building that didn't change, right? So two years ago this week, we had our launch day. How many of you, by show of hands, were here on our launch day? Look at how, many, how few hands are in the air right now. That's why I tell these stories over and over again, you guys. With your hands up, don't get mad at me. People around you don't know these stories. We want them to. So two years ago, uh, we had our launch day. We had some high hopes, but I think what happened since has exceeded everyone's expectations. Everyone's, except Jesus's maybe. But everyone else's expectations. And uh, about once a week, we get calls or we get emails or things, inquiries from other church leaders, other pastors, or Dr. Pace will get them or someone at St. Louis will get them and saying, what is happening and how are you doing this and what's going, we see the numbers, the worship attendance and the membership numbers and all this stuff and, and how are you doing this, what's the model, you know, what's the strategy, what's the business plan. And man, how I wish I had something really, really smart to tell them, because I've always dreamed of being like Steve Jobs in jeans and a black turtleneck and, you know, just struggling to make my genius known to lesser beings, you know, like, that's just, I have nothing that good to share. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And those of you who know how we operate, there's no, like, genius model underneath it all. Which there was, there's not. All, all that we have, all that we have is one thing. And those of you that have been around from the beginning, you know this. Only one thing has remained the same from three or two years ago to today. One thing has remained unchanged. And that is that from the very beginning, we have only preached Jesus. From the very beginning, we have only prayed to Jesus. We have only taught Jesus. We have only worshipped Jesus. And not some vague form of God, of old man in the clouds, but just Jesus who made God known in a personal way. We've only lifted up and followed Jesus, and we followed him to the third ward in Houston. We followed him to some of our city's worst brothels where captives are being freed. We followed him to the prisons in and around Houston. We followed Jesus to the Dominican Republic three times and a fourth time this June. We are unashamed of following him. We're unashamed of claiming him as uniquely God incarnate, and that has made all the difference from day one to today. That's the model. That's the truth. Is that just breaking it down to just Jesus and no other thing, no other issue, that's what has taken us this far. And we have spent eight weeks now, you all know, talking about the personality of Jesus and who he was, who he is, what you would notice about his personality, his humanity, if you were just to get to know him as a person. And, uh, and mainly we've been asking what sets him apart. And that question has been on my mind this week. This is the last week of this series. So the question that remains is what sets Jesus apart from other worldviews? And that question really is relative to where you are in life, is it not? Different people will ask and hear that question differently. If you're raised and steeped in Islam, you'll ask that question as if, you know, what's the difference between Jesus and Muhammad? My sense is that's not the question that's on many of your minds today. What's the difference between Jesus and Muhammad? That's not a daily issue for you. You don't make that decision every day. It's not the choice you're here to make. Some of you, you know, if you were dabbling in Eastern religions or if you were a Buddhist, you'd ask the same thing about Jesus and Buddha and what the difference is there. And should you choose Jesus or should you choose Buddha? My sense is that's an important question, but for most of you, that's not the question that's on your minds. Some of you, like if, if, for example, if you asked the people who knew Jesus, the people that followed him when he walked the earth, what it was that set Jesus apart, what he would say is that what sets Jesus apart is how uh, easy it is to follow him. Now, it's a sacrifice, but compared to the religious rigidity of the day, the prevailing worldview of this hyper Fundamentalist religion, following Jesus was easy, right? So it depends on who you ask and where you are in life when you hear that question. Your answer depends entirely on that. I hear a lot of people, though, who are considering becoming Christians. Many of you in this room, we sat in that room back there or in that gym over there or in that 
office building, those of you that were able to find it, over there, when we were officing over there, or in my office back here, or in some coffee house somewhere, and you've asked me some form of the question, I want to be a Christian, I don't want to be one of those Christians. I'm good with Jesus, I'm not sure I fit with other Christians. Because I've got a bunch of non-Christian friends, or I've got a bunch of agnostic friends, or a bunch of friends from other traditions, other cultures. I don't want them thinking that just because I become a Christian, I suddenly think they're going to hell. Can I be a Christian without disrespecting people of other faiths? It's It's a good question. And I get it because I was steeped in that kind of Christianity that said, look, Those of you who go to the right church and believe the right things in this life and proclaim the name of Jesus in this life, you're good to go. But man, everybody else, whoo, look out. They are the unfortunate casualties of God's sovereign will. So the grace of God looks like this. Everybody deserves this hellfire and torment forever, but just because these few people said Jesus in this life, God saves them, everybody else, I'm so sorry. And so Christians sit safely in the confines of four walls and say, we're good. They're not. It's interesting to me that Jesus never said that. Not quite the same way, right? So preachers and priests have said it. Guys like me have stood up here and said it. Maybe in part because it's to our immediate benefit to have you believe that belonging to the right religion and giving to the right religion is all that matters. Jesus never said it. Now, Jesus, some of you are thinking, but pastor, pastor, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. But I want you to hear how different it is for Jesus, the eternal son of the living God, to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. How different that is than for a preacher to stand and say, or a priest to stand and say, no one comes to the Father except through us, through the right church. And not one of those wishy-washy wannabe churches either, Episcopalians, a right church, a Bible-believing church. You know, no one comes to the Father except through us. That's very different. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus' disciples are all up in arms because they've witnessed this guy who's healing and and casting out demons and preaching in Jesus' name. But he's not a Christian. He's not one of them. He's not a disciple. And they said, Jesus, we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. And Jesus said, guys, relax. Relax, guys. Calm down. Whoever is not against us, well, they're for us. Jesus said, whoever's not against us is for us. That's a remarkable thing for a powerful religious leader to say. But it's Jesus who said it, proving once and for all that Jesus was infinitely cooler than most Christians you'll meet. Christians (laughs) who will just go to the ends of the earth to judge people or, you know, to to try it and and strain out that gnat, like Jesus always said. And instead of of following what Jesus actually taught. Now, the people, like Jesus' disciples, his family, his friends, Jesus himself, they were facing the prevailing worldview of their time. And Jesus stood in contrast to that worldview. That worldview was rigid religiosity. So it was driven by the Pharisees and the priests of Jesus' time. And the Pharisees and priests, they laid out 613 rules that you had to follow if you wanted to be in good standing with God. If you wanted to be able to enter into the courts of the temple and to worship with a clean conscience and to know that if you died, your soul would be okay with God, you had to follow these laws to the letter. And the Pharisees, they acted like religious police. They were always around watching for other people to sin. Did you notice that in the Gospels? Pharisees are always there watching, waiting for people to slip up so they can call you on it. They can require you to pay some penance for it. So there was all this anxiety among the people, all this fear. Fear. Am I really good with God or am I not? What more can I do to be better with God or to redeem myself for my sins? And some of those 613 laws, they made sense. They fit with our paradigm of Jesus. It's like love God. Well, that's great. We can do that. We believe that. Love your neighbor. That's awesome. We believe that. You know, Don't oppress the poor. Watch out for the vulnerable among you. All that's important. But then You know, as religion is prone to do, it goes off the rails, man. 613 is a big number, and not all those laws make sense. Like, if a man shaved the sides of his hair, 
like, or just buzz cut the sides of his hair like Timberlake or like Brad Pitt or somebody like, like, sorry, Brad, you know, you're done. Like, that's, that was a, a breaking of the covenant with God and you were required to, to make penance for that. If you shaved your beard with a razor, like I did this morning, I'm not really sure why, I don't really have a beard. I never was able to do that, but like some of you had a beard and you shaved with a, beard, with a razor, I'm sorry, but that's, that's breaking with your covenant with God. It's good news for James Harden, bad news for the rest of us uh, that uh, you would be out of luck. The 70th rule of the 613 said men must not wear women's clothing. Why are you all laughing? I'm just kidding. That's really bad news for uh, half the block that I live on in Montrose. And uh, women must not wear men's clothing. It's bad news for more than half the block of my block at Montrose. Uh, number 72, you are not to tattoo the skin, which is bad news for the whole block that I live on in Montrose, except Pastor Gio. She's the only untainted one. Among us, number uh, 278 says you have to break the neck of the donkey if the owner does not intend to redeem it. I don't know what that means. I don't know why. Why you got to break a donkey's neck. And I don't know what it means to redeem a donkey. I've never done that. So if anybody knows what that means, just come and tell me. But you got to break your donkey's neck if you don't want to redeem it. Number 423 was interesting. Number four, rule number 423 people had to follow in Jesus' day. Do not appear at the temple without your offering. That's convenient for guys like me. Don't come to church without your offering. You don't belong unless you've got something to give. It's bad news for the poorest among us. And then 491, I wanted to share 491 with you because I thought this was the weirdest of the 613. Y'all ready for this? Check this out. This is in the Bible. It's one of the 613 laws written out uh, by the Pharisees. You must break the neck of a calf by the river valley following an unsolved murder. That's it. That's it. Break the neck of a calf by the river valley following an unsolved murder. <laughs> uh, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. I don't think you'd say things. I think, what God? Like, I don't know, something else. But that is just bizarre. And all of these bizarre rules, everybody had to know and everybody had to wear the rules on their person, in a phylactery, which was a black box that you would strap on with leather straps on your wrist or on your forehead and so that it was with you all the time. And it was just a little black box with this little scroll in it, but man, was that thing heavy. Because everybody walked around feeling completely burdened by the law all the time. I'm not sure. Only those of us who grew up in really legalistic churches could understand how heavy a burden that must have been. And so when Jesus comes along in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 and says, guys, guys, listen, come to me, you heavy burdened, those of you who are weighed down. He's talking about these phylacteries. He's talking about the laws that are weighing people down and burdening them, making them lie awake at night to wonder if I die in my sleep, does God still love me because I'm not sure I followed all 613 laws. Oh my God, how do I atone? How do I make this right over and over again? How do I make this right? How much more do I have to give? And Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. He says, they've got 613 rules for you to follow. I've got two. Two. Love God. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then rest easy because we are good. It's not because of you. It's because of Jesus. He says, we are good. Come to me and you will have rest. Now, Jesus was very clear that it wasn't about disrespecting the 613. It wasn't about throwing religion under the bus. He wasn't even breaking with the law, he said. He said, I'm not here to destroy the law, I'm here to fulfill it. And so following Jesus doesn't mean disrespecting other religions. It doesn't mean throwing other religions under the bus 
or denying them as completely false or condemning them to eternal hell. Following Jesus just means seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of the completion of all religious practice, all religions and their identity. Jesus is the fulfillment of all religious expression in all times and all places. In Jesus, we find the fulfillment in it because Jesus doesn't just come along with a new set of religious laws to follow. He says, just love God and each other and know that we are good. C.S. Lewis, if, if, if that's one of your struggles, I just want you to hear the words of C.S. Lewis. If you've struggled to reconcile Jesus with the Christianity you've witnessed, and how exclusive it can be. I want you to hear these words. C.S. Lewis says, I could not believe Christianity if I were forced to say that there were a thousand religions in the world of which 999 were pure nonsense and the thousandth is fortunately true. My conversion very largely depended on recognizing Christianity as the completion, the actualization of something that had never been wholly absent from the mind of men. Do you see what he's saying? This is remarkable, you guys. He's saying that the story of Christianity, the story of Jesus, had already been imprinted on the minds of men, women, and children before Jesus ever walked the earth. Before he ever stepped foot on this planet, the story of Jesus, the gospel, was already known to humanity. And it's not just C.S. Lewis that says this. This is biblical stuff. Paul says it in Romans as well. Paul's most important letter, Romans chapter 1. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So in the creation of the world, just in living on this planet, you know God's identity and God's character. You know Jesus. And his gospel, this, this blows my mind. And I think this might be why Christianity is the first and only world religion that spreads so easily across cultural, ethnic, racial, national lines. Because no matter what culture you come from, no matter what religion you've belonged to, when you get to know the person of Jesus, it's like you've known him all along. It's like people wake up to this reality of Jesus and realize I've, I've felt this story. I've felt this story in my heart before I ever knew the name of Jesus. I felt the story about loving not just your friends or neighbors, but loving your enemies and forgiving your enemies even when they persecute you. I felt this idea of innocence sacrificing itself for guilt and the guilt of others. I know that story. I know the story of light over darkness. I know the story of good over evil and life over death. I know that story. So people all around the world as we speak are deciding to choose Jesus over whatever the prevailing worldview of their time and place might be. This, this is really important. Just like I said, I don't think many of you are having to choose between Christianity and Islam or Christianity and Buddhism, Christianity and Judaism, that's not on your minds. But I bet something is on your minds. Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe you're not even aware of it. The choice you have to make every day between Jesus and faith and the prevailing winds of culture. The choice you have to make every morning between faith and materialism. Between faith and and secularism. And it is a choice. The choice between Jesus and cynicism. Because you can choose. Every day you get to choose between believing that everything matters. That every person matters. Every life matters. And every story matters intrinsically. Because everything is of God and from God and from his glory. Created in his glory. Humanity created in his image. And will one day return to that image, to that glory. So it's intrinsically worthy because of God. Secularism, materialism will say, yes, things matter, people matter. But only because we decide they matter. Only because we say they matter. And so the... The most powerful humans among us, the smartest or whatever, get to decide who matters, who doesn't, and for how long and why. 
So there's worth there, but it's extrinsic worth. It's worth or value that is imputed upon a thing or a person because we humans say it, it is. Those are your choices to believe everything and every person is intrinsically, eternally worthy or things might matter, might not, depends on if we decide. In this worldview, the worldview of faith, everything is meaningful. Everything has meaning and purpose intrinsically. Over here, things like meaning and purpose and significance, those kinds of words should not be trusted. Because while people of faith would say that life is here for a reason, and that life is the result of God's creative action in the universe, and life itself is a form of the grace of God at work, over here they would say life your life and mine, history itself, as a result of some happy accident in an indifferent universe, some combination of lucky cosmology and evolutionary biology. And here we are, so we should just enjoy the ride. Over here, we would say every cell in your body matters and has a purpose, and God knows every hair on your he head. Over here, they would say... Every urge and every temptation, every need, every want, every desire that you have is just a natural need and a desire. You should just enjoy this life while you have it and you are the master of your own fate. Faithful worldview says worship. Worship is the act of orienting your life around something greater than yourself. What we do here is more than just being polite. It's more than just being good little American boys and girls. You know, apple pie, white bread, husband and wife, two and a half children, white picket fence. It's more than just being good citizens. What we're doing here is choosing to reorient our lives around our creator. Over here, we would say that what we do here is manipulation. It's coercion, it's making you feel good as if you're not alone, but really you are. It's just the opiate of the masses to keep us from just feeling completely devastated by our loneliness in the universe. So we buy things and we fill that void and we acquire things and we get things and we just keep the party going until we die. We have that choice every day. Faith and secularism, faith in Jesus and materialism. And every day you make that choice with the way that you live your life. I know that there are people here today who are on the verge of making that choice. Four years ago, last month, I stood on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and I made that choice. Now this was 12 years after becoming a pastor, but I realized as I stood on the Sea of Galilee shore, I realized that I had been worshiping me. I had been lifting myself up as my own highest ideal and my own first priority. I had been lifting my own popularity, my own self-image, my own self-worth up as the center of my universe. And I've never felt the Holy Spirit move so completely as I did that day, convicting me that I don't want to continue worshiping myself. Because there's two principles you should know about worship and humanity. Two, two things we know for sure. Everybody worships something. Like Bob Dylan, everybody's got to serve somebody. Second, you become like that which you worship or you become a reflection of that which you worship. And I just kept reflecting myself back to me. and I didn't like what I saw. I didn't want to become more like me. I wanted to become more like Jesus because the longer I became like me and putting myself at the center of the universe, nothing changed. And my wife's resentment toward me grew and my resentment toward her grew because nothing changed. The same old patterns, the same old mess. And I was the same kind of father and I was the same kind of pastor. I was the same kind of neighbor. I didn't want to be like me anymore. I wanted to be like Jesus I wanted to be like the one who empowered men, the one who emboldened women, the one who around women, he never made them feel objectified. The one around whom children always belonged. 
I wanted to be like Jesus who stood innocent, nailed to a cross, forgiving those who put him there. I wanted to be like Jesus, all powerful, all capable, who put on the robe of a slave and got down and washed his disciples' feet. I wanted to be like that because I knew when Jesus was at the center, everything would change, and it has. I can't explain it, but it just has. And with Jesus at the center of my life, I become more like him. My wife notices the change. My kids notice the change. My church notices the change. Because it's no longer about me. Every day you worship Jesus, you become a little bit more like him. That's that's key because you were created in his image to begin with. And so to worship Jesus and to aspire to be like him is no more complicated than just to aspire to be who you were created to be in the first place. Just like Jesus approached me on that shoreline, I know he's talking to some of you today and he has been for some time. And you can make that same decision to put him at the center. Please hear me when I say that I don't think God cares one bit how many more Methodists we make today or how many new members we get today. I couldn't tell you what our numbers are at this particular moment because that matters so much less to me than the wrestling that's going on in your heart right now. Because the story exists to inspire non-religious Houstonians to play their part in the story of God's love in Jesus. And I believe that you have a part to play, that you were created to play a part, and that he's calling you by name. Step up and place him at the center of your life and watch everything else begin to change. Would you join me in prayer, guys?